Welcome back to Stand with Kelly and Denali Shavaka. We want to continue our conversation with Representative Ben Carpenter. Representative Carpenter, can you tell us a little bit about who is behind funding your campaign and your opponent's campaign? I have been blessed this year with a lot of individual donations. Alaskans, both mostly inside this district and out, some outside this district, have have donated their hard-earned money to see me uh, elected to the Senate. I have also benefited from Republican Party and uh, affiliate membership um, organizations donating money to me, and that is it. I have received no PAC money. I have received no special interest money. It is all individual Alaskans. Berkman, on the other hand, has received a lot of PAC money, a lot of union money, a lot of special interest money, and he's received individual uh, uh, checks from from folks that are outside the district who are employed by organizations, companies, or, or nonprofits that are that are benefiting from state spending. Right. So it, if you if you're looking at it from a financial support perspective, it could not be clearer that the establishment, the the special interests down in Juneau that want to see a a budget continue the way that it is with spending our spending levels continue the way they are want to see bjorkman go down to juno they do not want to see carpenter go down to juno that is very clear by who's supporting the two candidates financially and that can only be because i have been very adamant and i have i've been very transparent with voters and, and with people in juno that we are spending too much we have a spending problem and we need to address that otherwise we're going to reach a fiscal cliff here in just a matter of years, and it's not going to be pretty for the state of Alaska. Absolutely. One of the things that concerns me on this defined benefit program that you're talking about, I was responsible for the retirement plan for the state of Alaska when I was commissioner of administration. And so we had the opportunity to do the fiscal report, the fiscal bill reporting for anything the legislature was proposing or considering when I was commissioner. And of course, this bill came up all three sessions that I was commissioner. And I was working with state government employees who have different political persuasions. And every time, Representative Carpenter, that this defined benefit plan came up, we would run the numbers. And every time, absolutely, hands down, this plan bankrupts the state. And so to your point, there is no longer a PFD fund if we put in defined benefit. I love this idea as a pension plan for our employees. However, it is not fiscally sustainable. And if there was a way to math it out where it could be fiscally sustainable, I would totally support it. And I think that you would too, but there's not. And then the other thing that we would consider for the legislature is, do we have a tax base large enough to support this plan? And the answer is, no, we don't. You could not possibly set in an income tax or a resource tax, an oil tax, a gas tax, a mining tax large enough to sustain this when you, when you, put the math out, when you um, cast out the vision to see how this would accumulate and aggregate over time, because you can't just pay a pension for five years, and you have employees that retire every year, and then you cast the vision out and the expanding lifespan of people, this becomes an absolutely enormous burden that literally bankrupts the entire state of Alaska long term. And there is no cash flow or resource stream or revenue stream that can pay for it. And so it is very concerning to me that we have not only legislators who would seriously consider it after receiving years and years and years of reports from state employees saying this is not fiscally sustainable or fiscally responsible, let alone fiscally conservative, but especially that we have so much PAC money and dark money from outside the state propping up candidates, especially in districts like yours, to send them to Juno with this agenda in mind. What is your take on all that? <clears throat> well, <laughs> it's interesting because the, the foundation argument, the foundation for this argument of why we need to go back to a defined benefits retirement system is because we, we say that we're having a hard time with recruiting and retention, right? And and the very, the very unions that are also responsible for recruiting and retaining employees are the ones that are pushing for a defined benefits retirement system. So they have a vested interest in not having very good um, um, recruiting and retention to prove that they need a defined benefit system. So they come up with this idea that, hey, we can have these levers and we can tweak this system and we can 
put things in there, automatic automatic things that happen, and it, and it won't cost us any money, and we can sell it to people because it's revenue neutral. The, the problem is, is that if you dig into the plan, the plan assumes that you have a flat or level number of employees going into the future. Like current numbers of employees is what we're going to stay on and, it, and it'll stay static. But the whole point of why we're having a conversation about this uh, retirement system is because we have a recruiting and retention problem. So Correct. the the workforce is telling us we need to have more employees, but the the retirement plan that we want to put in is has a foundation that says, well, our employee base is going to stay the same. You have to assume that so in alive. order for it to pencil out and it does not pencil that, out. That's right. So it's a lie from the get go. Right. There is no intention of state government to not include, not increase numbers of employees. Yeah. Yeah. So we've talked a lot about finances and how um, great your fiscal plan is. It sounds like it's going to be really effective. And I just wanted to pivot with the last few minutes that we have here and talk a little bit about the education system. I just, you know, graduated from college and my siblings are all still in school. And so I'm looking at our current education system and thinking this is a mess. Parents' rights are being ignored. Who knows what our kids are being taught in school nowadays? And I wanted to get your take on that and also what your plan is for education reform to keep American schools actually, you know, keeping our kids smart instead of dumbing them down to just become another cog in the wheel. Yeah, thank you. So uh, this is another area where where, we're... Jesse Bjorkman and I are are completely different um, philosophies. He being a a teacher and a union member is approaching this through a, we need to maintain and prop up the system of uh, education that we have. I am coming at this from a, from a parent's perspective that says the model and the, the education system that you're giving us, like you're selling us this, this education system is not working for us. It isn't meeting our needs as parents. And that's why, especially in the Kenai Peninsula Borough, you're seeing parents walk away. They're looking for alternatives, correspondence school, private school. They're, they're looking uh, charter schools. They're looking for alternatives where the parents have more control over the curriculum and the teachers and the, and the choices of education, the funding of education, because they see what's happening in this, this system that's being propped up by, by union support, that it's, it's not what they want. So... I instituted, after talking with teachers and parents, I, I created a, a teacher's bill of rights in this legislature, and, and you'll be, I'm shocked, I'm sure, to know that the, the education establishment didn't want to see this go through, but it would, it would say that teachers have a right to have a safe work environment in their classroom, and that includes a work environment where, where they're respected. So if they've got troubled children in the classroom, it becomes the administration and the parents' responsibility to solve this problem, mm-hmm. not the teacher in the classroom. That is what teachers and administrators should be doing to empower teachers, mm-hmm. but, but we're not. We've got this system that's not doing that right now, and it causes all sorts of problems in the classroom. Yeah. So what did we do this year? We said, if we're going to have a conversation about uh, a compromise between uh, raising funding for education, then we need to have one that ties in uh, parental choice and, and better res- uh, improving our results. And that was specifically tied to increasing the ability for parents to create charter schools within our, our schooling system, which is our charter schools are, are you know, one or two, uh, ranked one or two in the nation. We have very good charter schools. Mm -hmm. So why don't we just duplicate what's working in the state of Alaska and improve our quality of education by by empowering parents to have control or ownership of the the education process? That is what a charter school would do. And we we could do that with a lot of our brick and mortar schools. And over time, we would change the culture of this, you know, parents are able to wash their hands of the education of their kids in some cases, and that, that shouldn't be allowed. And the Mm -hmm. parents should be able to push back against the education establishment and say, Hey, whatever you're selling, whatever woke policies and curriculum you're selling, that's not okay with us. We're the ones that, that own this education system. Yeah, no, I agree. Being in when, before we moved to Alaska, being in the public school system was 
just an atrocious experience for me because everyone talks about wanting to do things for students and making sure the students are doing well and so well we need to make sure we respect their pronouns and we need to keep secrets from the parents but the fact of the matter is we're struggling to just learn basic math in school because we have so many kids that are just so disruptive and the teachers have absolutely no ability to discipline them at all whatsoever for fear that they're going to be fired for fear that the parents are going to throw a temper tantrum and so then what ends up happening is kids like me and my siblings who want to go to school and who want to learn end up being stunted by these kids who can just act out in class and the teachers can't do anything about it so at the end of the day i fully believe in support in restoring parental rights to the education system because the parents rights are the students rights and if you want to make sure that your kid gets educated and your child grows up to become a force in the world you need to make sure that it starts in the school system and we need to make sure that we reform it to reflect that. And I'm really glad to hear that you supported a teacher's bill of rights because one of the things that really concerned me about the massive base student allocation bill that Bjorkman and others supported that would have added so much to our government spending is it wasn't tied to results. And one of the things that I've seen in so much of our school spending across the state is the school districts will get a lot of money from the state and then it goes to administration and facilities. They build more buildings and they put it into overhead and administration and they actually actually are not paying our teachers and they're cutting their salaries mm -hmm. and they're not taking care of our students and what the students need in the classroom. And so the, the places where we need the money most, it's actually being being cut and forgotten. And that's why we're not seeing results. And there was no mechanism to tie the increase in school funding to the actual results. And all that was going to go up is government debt. So <laughs> I think you're absolutely right to say who's looking out for the teachers and what are we doing? And I think it's interesting your insight that the people who are supposed to be looking out for the the teachers are actually opposing that mm -hmm. because it goes against their agenda. So Ben Carpenter, thank you so much for being on the show. Tell us where can people donate to your campaign to support you? If, if you go to my website, uh, Ben Carpenter for Alaska, there's a link there to donate. And if you've got questions, you can reach out to me. 907-690-6494 uh, is my phone number. And I, I'll love to take your calls and have a conversation, go more in depth. We appreciate that. Ben Carpenter for Alaska.com. Representative Ben Carpenter, thank you for being on the show. We are so happy to have had you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, this has been another great episode of Stand with Kelly and Denali Shabaka, and you can catch us on standshow.org. We will see you next time. Thanks, and be courageous, everybody. Have a great week.